It's Monday, April 27, 2015. This is PSN News. Tonight on PSN News, we'll have the latest on the earthquake in Nepal. We'll also have an interview on the upcoming Move In On Festival coming up on PSN News. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm James Hutchison. And I'm Shannon Ryan. On Saturday, a massive earthquake devastated the country of Nepal. The natural disaster proved to be the worst earthquake in 80 years. A day later, Nepal was faced with a major aftershock. So far, more than 3,800 deaths have been confirmed. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the earthquake occurred in one of the most hazardous locations on Earth. The quake also registered on the Richter scale with a magnitude of 7.8. It is believed that anywhere from dozens to hundreds remain trapped underneath mounds of rubble. Armenians from across the globe stood in solidarity last Friday by commemorating what is described as the first modern genocide. Starting in 1915, at least one and a half million Armenians were killed in massacres and deportations. The government of Turkey maintains that the wartime killings of Armenians were not genocide. Despite initially promising to use the word genocide to describe this event, President Obama has declined from doing so for the seventh consecutive year of his administration. Diplomatic experts believe this is because Turkey remains the only Muslim-majority country in NATO. President Barack Obama gave a speech praising the U.S. intelligence agency the day after revealing that two al-Qaeda hostages were accidentally killed. The White House announced Thursday that a counterterrorism operation against an al-Qaeda compound unintentionally killed two aid workers in January, one of whom was American. The attack also killed two American al-Qaeda leaders. President Obama said the U.S. did not know that they were in the target location even though intelligence officials logged hundreds of hours surveying the area. The president said that they are going to review what happened and make procedure adjustments to prevent the loss of any more innocent lives. On Tuesday, former SS Sergeant Oskar Groening told a German court that he helped keep watch as thousands of Jews were led from cattle cars directly to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. The 93-year-old former guard is charged with 300,000 counts of accessory to murder. At his trial, he said he witnessed individual atrocities but did not acknowledge participating in any crimes. In a lengthy statement to the court, Groening testified that he volunteered to join the SS in 1940 and served at Auschwitz from 1942 to 1944. Groening could face a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison if convicted. The Drug Enforcement Administration is trying to regain the public's trust. The chief of the DEA, Michelle Leonard, announced on Tuesday that she will retire beginning in mid-May. In recent weeks, Leonard has come under fire from lawmakers after an inspector general report found that some DEA agents had sex parties in Colombia with prostitutes paid for by drug cartels. Earlier this month, Republican and Democrat members of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee released a statement saying they had no confidence in Leonard. Loretta Lynch made history on Thursday after a Senate vote made her the first African-American female attorney general in history. The 56 to 43 vote ended the heavily publicized battle to choose President Barack Obama's next attorney general. Lynch takes the role after serving twice as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. During her two terms, she has tried more terrorism cases since 9-11 than any other officer. Regardless of her accomplishments, the delay of her nomination neared record-breaking proportions. Republicans leading the Senate refused to bring her nomination up for vote until Democrats changed the language on an unrelated bill. Researchers in China confirmed on Friday that they genetically modified human embryos for the first time ever. Rumors about the research first circulated in March, inciting a debate over its implications. Some argue that such genome editing 
holds the promise to eradicate hereditary diseases. Others fear that changing the human gene line could pose dangerous risks to the health of future generations. While the gene editing tool successfully sliced DNA in 28 of the embryos, it only replaced the gene in a mere fraction of them, and even introduced unwanted mutations in some. The researchers behind the new study agreed the technique isn't ready to be used in a clinical setting. Penn State Police have a fresh face as VP. We'll have more coming up. Old Main Lawn was entirely illuminated by candles last night in memory of nine Penn State students who died this past year. The University Park Undergraduate Association held the Night of Remembrance Vigil, which included the ringing of the Old Main Bell nine times, once for each student. The event also included non-denominational readings, a performance by a cappella group Shades of Blue, and a chance for students who knew the deceased to speak on their behalf. According to UPUA legislation, this annual service stopped in 2008 due to a lack of attendance and logistical complications. Hundreds came out in support of suicide prevention on Sunday at Sydney Friedman Park. The Central Pennsylvania chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention held its ninth annual Out of the Darkness Walk. The walk followed Penn State's Active Minds Club Send Silence Packing exhibit in the Hub Robeson Center on Wednesday. At the event, more than 800 people walked three and a half miles through downtown State College to raise awareness for mental health and the fight against suicide. The walk also featured a live performance, therapy dogs, and food. This year, $40,000 was raised for the cause with half of the proceeds going to the National Organization for Research on Suicide Prevention. Penn State is facing yet another lawsuit, this time from seven of its own Board of Trustees members. On Monday, the alumni elected members asked a judge for access to confidential documents used by former FBI Director Louis Free and his team to create Free's 2012 report. Free's report detailed his investigation into Penn State's handling of the Jerry Sandusky child sex abuse case. President, Penn State President Eric Barron and Board Chairman Keith Masser released a statement saying they rejected the board members' demand in order to uphold confidentiality measures. Penn State Police have a new Vice President. The Daily Collegian reports that a former Pennsylvania State Police officer stepped in on Tuesday as the interim VP for University Police and Public Safety. Interim Vice President Timothy Mercer worked for the state police for 27 years before retiring as a lieutenant colonel. His first order of business was reassigning his predecessor, Steve Shello, to special projects in the finance and business department. This quick change comes after Shello stepped down on April 8th because of an unfavorable administrative review. Mercer agreed to fill in until the university finds a permanent replacement. Penn State faculty and staff will now be able to have gender confirmation surgery if they need it. The Daily Collegian is reporting that the university recently added the surgery to the Highmark Blue Shield health insurance plan. Staff members have had access to hormone therapy and counseling for several years, but with this addition, those suffering from gender dysphoria can take their treatment a step further. The student health plan already covers the procedure. Gender identity has a been a hot topic recently. In the wake of this public conversation, Penn State can say it's on the support side. Penn State President Eric Barron's Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Task Force continues to move forward. The Daily Collegian reports that as of this month, a pilot of the climate survey was sent out to a sampling of University Park and Commonwealth campus students. This survey will be an important step in gauging what students understand and how colleges can better deal with the epidemic of sexual assault on campus. Questions for this survey should be able to generate meaningful responses that will encourage discussion. The Sexual Assault Task Force emphasizes that in order for there to be a change, students should take the survey and take it honestly. We'll be right back with this interview with Moving On. Stay tuned. 
Welcome back, I'm Jess Arnold. Moving on, Penn State's annual music festival is the end of this week. To help us get ready, I'm joined today by the festival's, festival's finance director, Brandon Follick. Brandon, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Of course, and to start off, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what Moving On is? Yeah, sure. So Moving On is um, basically Penn State's end of year festival funded by UPAC. And it's basically uh, the university's way of celebrating the seniors graduating and their way of moving on to um, you know, whatever it is, whether it's like pre-professional education or employment or other lifelong journeys that happen after graduation, as well as celebrating some of the uh, student diversity and music interests. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And I know that this year is the 40th anniversary, correct? Yeah, it's Great. been a long-running Penn State tradition. And what music acts are going to be there to help us celebrate this big event? So it's being opened up by the Battle of Bands Winter Meet Cities, um, a local band here started by students. And we'll also have Atmosphere, um, New Politics, Passion Pit, and Big Sean. Great. And can you just tell me a little bit about the process of getting these bands? I know you mentioned the Battle of the Bands. So could you talk about that as well as the other headliners? Right. So uh, just to start off with that, every year we host a Battle of the Bands where student acts will perform. And the winner of that will open up for moving on at the beginning of the festival. And then some of our other acts are booked by a booking agent. Um, we seek out bands through a company called Concert Ideas, and we use a booking agent to basically contact different artist managers. And he lets us know like who's available, who plays at college shows, what's their pricing. And then from there, we kind of decide, like how are we going to formulate this lineup? OK, and I know you said you send out a survey, too, to try and generate student interest yeah. and make sure that we're representing those voices. Yeah, so we want this to be basically for the students. So what we do is we try to gauge um, what type of performers these students want, and if there's a specific form or a specific performer that students really want to see here at Penn State. And can you tell us about how this year's event is going to be different from last year's? I know you said that you're going to add some special projects or different features. Yeah, so we have a lot of on-site projects that are going with the festival this year. Um, I know one thing off the top of my head is we're having a huge recycling effort this year, so that'll be a little more um, prominent than years past. Um, and we'll also have different non music perf or non music acts like a balloon artist and like someone who'll do caricatures we're having an activities tent where all this will be housed and we're also adding an EMS tent so that way we have a safer event great and when and where can we expect to see moving on um, moving on will be this Friday it is in the blue band field which is also known as I am lot 12 it'll start at 3 30 and go until 10 30 Great. And for those who didn't get involved this year, but then see it, love it, and want to get involved next year, how can they do that? Right. So uh, this is a student-run organization. Um, basically, we have these chairs. It's, uh, they make up what we call the core committee, and each member of the core committee has a specific role in moving on. And we also have our executive board, and we also have a volunteer pool for people who just want to help out for the day of the festival. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing no this information. Thanks I'm for sure having me. I'm sure we all look me. forward to attending. Yeah, it'll be great. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be right back with Nicole Barros with Sports. Stay tuned. From the students of Penn State Meteorology, here is your Penn State Campus Weather Service forecast. Good evening, Penn State student meteorologist Faith Eretz here with your campus weather surface forecast on this dreary Monday, April 27th. I hope you all got out and enjoyed the beautiful weather we had this past weekend. And I have good news for you, actually, that that weather will be coming back for the remainder of the week. Unfortunately, tonight, those clouds and showers will stick around. A few more rain showers are likely tonight. Temperatures only getting down to around 40 degrees, but the real story is that wind out of the northwest up to 20 miles an hour. So it will be a pretty gusty night here, making it feel much colder than 40 if you go outside for the rest of the night. Luckily, tomorrow we will see clearer skies, temperatures well into the 60s, as well as calmer winds. So tomorrow will be an absolutely beautiful Tuesday here in State College. So definitely make sure to go out and enjoy the weather. The rest of the week, surprisingly, looks like much of the same, except, of course, we have to have one day to put a damper on all these beautiful days overnight Wednesday. Clouds and showers will move through the area, affecting the day on Thursday, making for quite a muggy middle of the week there. But throughout the day Friday, those will move out of Pennsylvania, making for a spectacular weekend here at Penn State. Highs up to 70 and even a little bit above that on Sunday with absolutely beautiful, clear skies to look forward to for the beginning of our finals week. Now, if you take nothing else away from this forecast, I'd like you to remember just these three very simple points to get you through the week. Of course, we will have a rainy Thursday to put a damper on the rest of this absolutely beautiful week we'll see here. We definitely deserve a very nice spring week after that winter we saw. 
I would also like to say thank you to the cast, crew, and viewers of PSN News, and good luck to everybody on their upcoming finals. Stay tuned for Sports Next on PSN News, and have a wonderful evening. Hello everyone, I'm Nicole Barros with this week's Sports Wrap-Up. The Penn State men's lacrosse team defeated Michigan 10-9 this past weekend, earning its 500th win in the program's 102-year history. With the win, the Nittany Lions will advance to the Big Ten tournament slotted as the number four seed. In the semifinal game of this inaugural tourney, the team will take on Johns Hopkins this Thursday in College Park, Maryland. The Blue Jays earned the number one seed with a win over Maryland this past Sunday. Penn State enters the postseason with a two-game win streak in hand and losing records in both Big Ten play and overall. Another team with success, the Penn State women's lacrosse team. The NCAA bracket was announced Sunday afternoon with Penn State earning a bye into the Big Ten semifinals on Friday. The number two seeded Nittany Lions will play Friday evening against either third seeded Northwestern or sixth seeded Michigan, two teams Penn State defeated during the regular season. This is the first Big Ten tournament in women's lacrosse, and with four out of five Big Ten wins under Penn State's belt, the team looks to win an automatic bid to the NCAA championship. Action begins Thursday afternoon as Michigan and Northwestern battle it out to determine Penn State's opponent. The Penn State women's softball team swept Rutgers this past weekend, earning two conference wins. Reporter Ryan Birdie was at Beard Field for the second game and has more. It was another rainy day in Happy Valley, but that did not stop the Penn State softball team from their doubleheader against the St. Francis Red Flashes. St. Francis took the first game of the series with a 5-4 win after halting a Penn State late game rally. The second game, however, brought bad weather as well as a bad start, especially for St. Francis player Madison Cabell, who left the game early after foul tipping a ball into herself at the plate. After two full innings of scoreless softball, the Red Flashes earned a run in the top of the third and the Nittany Lions answered back with five runs that included two homers in the inning's bottom half. St. Francis tried to respond with another run in the fourth, but the Lions scored nine more runs, resulting in the mercy run rule and an early ending to the game. With the win in the second game, Penn State split the doubleheader and ended a four-game losing streak. Penn State now just has seven games left on the season as their year begins to wind down. The Nittany Lions will have several conference games down the stretch of the season, including a Rutgers series that starts on Friday. From PSSN, I'm Ryan Birdie. It was a rough weekend for Penn, State, for Penn State baseball. The team which has struggled on the road began a seven-game home stretch against number eight Illinois. The Fighting Illini was coming off a 14-game winning streak heading into the series and defeated the Nittany Lions in all three games. Penn State's biggest struggle was scoring early runs. In two of the three games, the team faced a large deficit early on and couldn't come back. Penn State lacked momentum in the first game, struggled to withstand extra innings in the second, and failed to make a comeback in the third. Penn State will take on Pitt on Wednesday before facing Rutgers in its final home games of the season on Friday. And finally, another Penn State coach made history this past weekend. Mark Pavlik earned his 500th win as the men's volleyball team swept in-state rival St. Francis on Saturday. Pavlik has been coaching for 21 years and led the team to a national championship in 2008. The win marked the third time in the last five years that Penn State has gone undefeated in conference play during the regular season. Next up, the 7th ranked Nittany Lions will host the 2015 EIVA Championships for the 18th consecutive year beginning on Thursday. Penn State will be the number one overall seed in the fields with Harvard, George Mason, and Princeton. And that's all for Penn State Sports. PSN News will be right back with this week's entertainment. Stay tuned. And that does it for us here at PSN News Tonight for April 27, 2015. Thanks for joining us and make sure to check us out on Twitter at PSN News. And make sure to watch us every Monday live at 7 p.m. Have a good night and thanks for watching and we'll see you back in the fall because yeah, this is our last episode. Yeah, thank you for joining us on this special occasion. If you're a student out there, good luck with your finals. Yep, you're all absolutely. scholastic stars. Good luck. <laughs> we'll right. see you soon. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.